Yeah, right. You, you've got to put constraints on because you don't want to do something silly. Uh, you know, if you if you get your op if you get your covariance matrix from some kind of a model, or if you get your uh, your expected returns from some chunk of history, uh, there might be something. Uh, maybe that's a pretty good uh, source of estimates, but maybe there's something a little. Maybe there's an Achilles heel in those estimates, and you just don't want to give the model its complete head, and uh, so you put in constraints. That's what everybody does, and it's your own intuition as to what would be an obviously silly result that your client would say, get out, or something where you wouldn't want to take that much of a risk that you're going to lose your, you know. It may be that you're doing something which on the average over the long run will be wonderful, but if you lose your client in the first year, why, you know, that's not very good. Uh, this next question comes from George Matthias of Brewer Investment Group in Chicago, <coughs> your hometown. Yeah. Uh, if two asset classes perform relatively the same and are non-correlated, should there be equal allocations in a portfolio to both asset classes? Um, if they're non-correlated with everything, let's, I mean, if if they're not correlated with each other, that, that's not the relevant thing. The question is, are they correlated with something else? And if they're already, if one of them is highly correlated with the rest of your portfolio and the other isn't, then obviously you go for the one that's not highly correlated with your portfolio. If nothing is correlated with anything, in, in other words, if, if, you had a, if you had a portfolio with completely uncorrelated investments, then it turns out that uh, the minimum variance portfolio uh, and so we're assuming everybody has the same expected return, so you're going to go for the minimum variance portfolio, which I assume all portfolios have the same expected return. Uh, the minimum variance portfolio has investments proportional, uh, I'm sorry, inversionally proportional to variances, not to standard deviation, but to variances. And our last question this afternoon comes from Jacob Bungie of Lipper Hedgeworld, also in Chicago. Uh, he asks, how has the behavior of commodity markets changed with the influence of new funds and investor interests over the past few years? So new commodity yeah. funds coming into the market, right. hedge funds. And right. Uh, the, uh, you know, first place, uh, I'm not a commodities fund expert. I uh, once, uh, uh, although lately, you know, I'm in, uh, <laughs> in Barclays uh, commodity, uh, you know, commodity fund. Uh, but... Uh, I, I have uh, two, you know, two, three things come to mind. One is I once uh, did a lecture about how to uh, uh, make a small fortune in commodities. You know how to make a small fortune in commodities? No. You start with a large fortune <laughs> is, the old, is the old saying, right. Uh, uh, also, uh, uh, Elton, Elton and Gruber, Elton, Elton, Gruber and Cad, no, Elton and Gruber, I can't remember one other name, I forget. Uh, did uh, research on uh, managed commodity funds, not index commodity funds, but managed commodity funds. And they found the following, uh, and this was you know, 10, 15 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, so uh, maybe the situation is a little different, but not that much different. They found that uh, uh, the public commodity funds uh, came from previously private commodity funds. And if you took the population of uh, commodity managers, private commodity managers, half of them did better and half of them did worse. The half that did better went public. And they had some explanation about why they were great. Mm -hmm. And this, you know, and the papers would write down, the newspaper would why they were great. Now, of these, half of them did better <laughs> and half of them did worse. And, uh, you know, and it was... It seemed as if it was random. Uh, so at that time, uh, commodity managers were not outperforming the, the market, you know, and they were, uh, in fact, uh, one of, uh, they, uh, uh, Elton and Gruber found that, uh, uh, Elton Gruber, I have one more name, found that uh, uh, that it wasn't really a very attractive asset class. Uh, uh, now, uh, uh, and then, one referee said, if it's such an unattractive uh, asset class, it's a managed commodity fund. If it's such an uh, unattractive 
passive class, why doesn't it disappear? And they came up, they figured out this explanation. Now, uh, so I'm talking about managed where somebody tries to uh, do predicting. Uh, uh, the uh, the uh, we have now uh, uh, people who uh, try to do predicting, and we have people who more or less in, you know, index the the asset classes, mm -hmm. and uh, I think uh, uh, commodities as a group uh, uh, have, a, have a natural place, and the availability of commodity ETFs uh, ha have a natural place. Uh, you, fo you folks are trend, trend, uh, trend followers, trend followers uh, both up and down, True. and diversify, and uh, uh, funny thing, uh, you do very, very well most of the time and on the average, but there are times when the market, there are times when the market tends to trend, and then there's market, there are times when the market tends to go up, down, up, down, up, down. Uh, and uh, so, you know, sometimes you win and sometimes you don't. On the average, over the long run, you've done very, very well. Okay, so what I'm saying, uh, let me try to wrap it up. Uh, commodities as an asset class are here to stay. Right. Certainly, as index funds, they're here to stay. Uh, as far as uh, uh, hedge funds that try to predict uh, individual commodities, uh, uh, they're uh, they're certainly worrisome. Although you, uh, with this uh, diversified portfolio of uptrends and downtrends, have certainly done very well on the average. Well, thank you. I, I've noticed that you know over 30, 40 years, commodities as an index have had an inverse relation to stocks or a negative correlation. Uh, whereas a lot of hedge funds or managed futures funds uh, that are trading long and short in financial markets and commodity markets maybe have had a lower correlation to stocks, more like a zero correlation. So do you think that it makes more sense to, to go into just commodities which have a negative correlation to stocks if stocks go up in the future? Uh, or is it more wise just to look for non-correlated asset classes? And if so, I, how can we find them as investors? Right. right. Now, uh, let's uh, not uh, in include super, you know, suppose that you're not big enough to put some money in super fund, uh, and you're just, you know, you're an individual investor. Uh, uh, I would, uh, uh, there's an interesting book by Roger Gibson, uh, about uh, asset management, I don't, I can't remember the title, but he tries, uh, uh, he tries, uh, he shows historically how well you would have done if you had put your money in certain broad asset classes like commodities and uh, securities and uh, and land, uh, and one more I can't think of, and uh, uh, historically. One of these asset classes would, you know, one year one would be best, and another year the other would be best. And uh, in fact, they sort of took history and sort of divided it equally among them. But if you'd put one fourth of your money in each of them, uh, you would have out you would have outperformed any of them over any reason period of time. So, as I said, diversify, diversify, diversify. Ladies and gentlemen in Europe and the United States, on behalf of Superfund and its founder Christian Baja. I want to thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, Professor Markowitz, we really appreciate your time this afternoon and your insightful comments. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening to everyone in Europe and to those in the United States. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.